Uh, greetings, my name is Lucas Mann, and uh, I come out here this afternoon to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you, to share the good news of eternal life as it is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say all that I say because Scripture has already said it. Don't take anything I say as authoritative unless it is derived from God's Word itself. And friends, I will say that whatever I say this afternoon will be based off the Word of God. It will be found in the Scriptures. In fact, I would exhort you in the words of the Lord Jesus to search the Scriptures, to study the Word of God, and to see if these things that I say are true. And if they are true, then my friends, you are responsible before God. You must come to grips with these realities, whether in this life or in the life to come. And these are important truths. These are important truths for your soul. If they weren't, I wouldn't be out here proclaiming them to you. But nonetheless, they are. They are indeed of great importance to you. My friends, Jesus Himself said in John 14, 6 that He is the way and the truth and the life and there is no other way to God but through Him. And friends, even when it comes to Christ, there are few among those who say that they know Him that truly are in His kingdom. For Jesus said that there are many on the day of judgment who will say to Him, Lord, Lord, and he says, I will say to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. And so therefore, these things are, as it were, double layered of importance. You must be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, my friends. I come here seeking to make known the gospel of Jesus Christ that comes to sinful man and exposes him for who he is, but shows him the way of life. That it is through faith in the finished work of Christ, that it is in faith uh, in, the, in the work of Christ upon the cross, where He placated the wrath of God against the sins of His people. That's the heart of the Gospel, friends, and that's where your hope for heaven has to be set. That's where you have to put all your confidence and trust as the hymn writer wrote, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Friends, if your hope is not built on Christ, it's built on the shifting sands of self. It's built on the unstable ground of your own self-produced righteousness that really is no righteousness at all. For the prophet Isaiah said our righteous, our, our righteous deeds are before God like filthy rags. My friends, we are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Not by works of the law have we been justified, but by faith in Christ. It goes back to Him. And you may say, why are you preaching to a place that is predominantly Christian, especially here in the South, in the Bible Belt. Churches everywhere. Most of us have had some sort of religious experience. It's because amongst the religious does the Gospel need to be spread. Even amongst those who say that they know Christ. There are many false converts. There are many goats among the sheep. There are many pieces of wheat amongst... Or many pieces of tares amongst the wheat, my friends. It is easy to make a false profession. It is easy. And so I desire today not only to present the gospel to you, but even to expose false professors, to expose false Christians, for they bring great reproach upon the name of God. And ultimately it is my desire to glorify God through the preaching of the gospel of His Son. We know that Jesus Christ is glorified when He is lifted up, when the truth of what He has done upon the cross, the truth of His resurrection, 
the truth of his intercession for his people, when these truths are brought forth, Christ is honored, Christ is magnified. Because ultimately the gospel is not about us, it's about the glory of Christ, it's about the glory of God. In fact, we know that the Bible says God is for His people, that He loves His people. But even above that, God is for Himself. God is for God. God has made all things for His own glory. And they redound and they work toward that end. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, My glory I will not give to another. God is a jealous God, jealous for His own glory. And so therefore, wherever the gospel is preached, may it bring God alone the glory. The passage of Scripture that I would like to explain this afternoon, that I would like to highlight before you, is found in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 beginning in verse 9. And the Apostle Paul is writing here, and he is speaking about Abraham. Abraham was a very significant Old Testament uh, figure. He was looked upon by the Jewish people in the first century as really the model of faith, the model Christian, you could say, the model man who was to serve God. If you wanted to know how to be obedient to God and to have faith in God, you'd look to Abraham. And Paul, in this chapter of Romans, speaks about Abraham. Listen to what he says in verse 9. And he begins by talking about the blessing of salvation. The blessing of salvation in Jesus Christ. He says, Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? In other words, is it for the Jewish or for the non-Jewish people? He says, For we say... Faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. And these truths that Paul speaks of here are what I want to specifically highlight this afternoon. That salvation is not for a select group. Because Paul deals with that here. He deals with the gospel, circumcision, and uncircumcision. And that's what I would title this sermon. The gospel, circumcision, and uncircumcision. Paul wrestles with these great ideas, these, these difficult concepts. And for us in our day and age, it may not be hard for us to see this. But in the first century, this was a great issue amongst the early Christians. Was salvation freely offered by God to the Gentiles? Was God an impartial God? Could whoever call upon the name of the Lord, would they receive a reply from Him? Would they receive salvation? And the answer from the apostles and from all true Christians in the first century for the most part was yes. Yes, God is the God of both Jews and Gentiles. That unlike in the Old Testament dispensation where he purposefully limited himself over the Jewish people for the most part, and that was to bring about the birth of the Messiah, the floodgates have been opened now and the Gentiles have free entrance into the kingdom. The gospel has been taken to the Gentiles. As we know that Paul and the apostles preached the gospel with fervency and passion to the Jewish people in the first century, but they rejected it as many of you do, as many of you turn away from the gospel, you do exactly what the Jewish people did in the first century. And friends, that is not a good state to be in. And therefore, it is my plea to you that you would turn to Christ, 
Rather than turning a deaf ear to the hearing of the gospel, you would turn a listening ear to it. And you would deny yourself and take up your cross and come after the Lord Jesus Christ. For He said that the one who loses his life for my sake, He is the one who will save it. So as I said, this issue of God's impartiality for us may be easy to comprehend, but Paul deals with it very systematically in these few verses. And it's important that we consider it because he's talking about the gospel in its essence. Who it reaches. Who is it for? It's for whoever will believe it. It's for whoever will believe it, whether circumcised or uncircumcised, whether Jewish or Gentile, whether black or white, whether rich or poor. The gospel is for all the nations. Christ Jesus himself said to take the gospel. He told his disciples in Matthew 28 to take the gospel to all nations. And so I want to consider these truths now. But before we do that, the context very briefly of these few verses. As I mentioned briefly already earlier, Paul's discussing uh, Abraham and how Abraham is a model for saving faith. In fact, in the beginning of the chapter, he says in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather according to the flesh is found? We know that Abraham was specifically chosen by God to be the father of the Jewish nation. And Paul, of course, being a Jew, says he's our forefather. Let's look at what he did. Let's look at how he was saved. Because sadly, many of the Jewish people in the first century rejected the gospel and held on to a works righteousness gospel, a salvation by human effort. And so Paul wants to contradict that faulty lie and show them that salvation is by grace through faith. And he holds up the father of the Jewish people as the example. So he says in verse 2, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Verse 3, For what does the Scripture say? And then he gives us a quotation out of Genesis 15, 6. Very early on in the Bible. The 15th chapter in the book of Genesis. He says this, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, God gave Abraham specific promises, and Abraham believed those promises. And therefore, God credited to Abraham a righteousness not his own. The righteousness of Christ, namely. He gave him the righteousness of Christ, and he was thereby justified. We know that Jesus said in John 8 that Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day, and he saw it and was glad. And you ask, how did Abraham know about Christ in the Old Testament? He himself had not come. Well, if we go back further in Genesis to Genesis 3, God gave a promise to Adam and Eve. And he was actually speaking specifically to the serpent who would deceive the woman and the man. But of course, it was given to both the man and woman as well. And he says to the serpent that there is coming a seed of the woman who would crush his head. And there we find the beginnings of the revelation of the gospel of Christ, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. It was seen already in that third chapter of Revelation, or excuse me, third chapter of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And so going back to Romans 4, Paul then continues to speak of salvation. And in verse 6, he now brings up David, who was Israel's greatest king as an example. He says, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. So now Paul's saying, okay, Abraham's a good example, but let's go further. Let's show you David, who was Israel's greatest king. How was he saved? And so Paul quotes from the Psalms. Verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. O oh friend, I hear no word of man's effort in this passage. I hear no word of man's deeds. Rather, I hear of the grace of God. And such is salvation. Such is the nature of salvation. That it is not by human effort, but by grace. Grace. 
by grace through faith. Not just this grace that's dispensed upon everyone. Not everyone will be saved. The Bible does not advocate for universalism. Jesus said only few will be saved. It is those who are humble enough to see that they are filthy, wretched sinners. And in need of God's judge, or excuse me, deserving of God's judgment, and in need of God's saving grace. For Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. But sinners. As the old hymn says, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. My friends, Christ is the friend of sinners, but only for those sinners who are disgusted with their sin. He's not there to justify people in their sin. He's not there to give you a pat on the back to say you're okay because you say you're a Christian, but continue to live in blatant sin. Rather, Christ came to save from sin, to save from the power of sin, to save from the effect of sin, to save from slavery to sin. Jesus said in John 8 that everyone who sins is the slave of sin. But then He said, but if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Friends, I have been set free from the slavery to sin that I once lived in. And you likewise can be saved from your slavery to sin. So going back there to Romans 4, that's a sufficient summarization of the context, and that brings us to the beginning of verse 9, where Paul says this, speaking of the gospel, circumcision, and uncircumcision. He says in verse 9, Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Again, quoting Genesis 15:6. In other words, he's saying, well, we know that salvation is by faith, but who are the ones that can partake of this salvation? It is whosoever wills. Whosoever wills, come. I love what the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 55, which is really an invitation to sinners, invitation to lost souls. Listen to what it says, Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon There is a free offer that is given in the gospel, my friends, and it is of God's free grace. And so the invitation is given. And Paul is really, really highlighting to the Jewish people here in Romans 4 something that was already brought forth in the Old Testament, as I just quoted from Isaiah 55. And so what a glorious reality that that, that, that is. That there is no condition. You, must, you do not have to clean yourself up to come to Christ. You do not have to try and procure a certain measure of righteousness before He will accept you. Rather, we come to Christ as we are, as sinners in the hands of an angry God, as sinners under the rightful wrath of the Almighty, seeking forgiveness, seeking salvation from that wrath. And it's interesting to point out that the wrath of God is something that bothers men's consciences to such a great extent 
that if you were to step foot in many churches in this very county, you're not going to hear that word. You're not going to hear that spoken of a lot. The wrath of God. It makes men uncomfortable. But it's true, my friends. It's real. What does Paul say in the first chapter of Romans? Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Friends, the Gospel comes to us and says that. The Word of God comes to us and it says that to us, that we are under the wrath of God. But the good news is found in the fact that Christ, on behalf of His people, satisfied that wrath justly. See, God just doesn't sweep sin under the rug, my friends. Rather, there must be justice. There must be punishment. Someone must be penalized. Someone must take upon themselves the wrath of God if we are ever to enter into heaven. And it will either be us in hell forever or it will be God Himself for there is no man that can stand in our place. There is no angelic being that can stand in our place. It must be God. God must save us by Himself, for Himself, from Himself, and for His own glory. Going back to Romans 4. Verse 10, Paul says, How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or while uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. One of the, one of the controversies in the early, early church was that many Jewish Christians told the Gentile converts that if they wanted to be true Christians, they had to first receive the sign of circumcision, which set the nation of Israel apart from the rest of the Gentile nations in the Old Testament era. And Paul and the apostles had to counter this and say, no, no. Otherwise, that nullifies grace. There are no conditions for salvation. It is all of God's free grace. And the apostles strongly opposed this false teaching. And so Paul shows his Jewish readers here, that Abraham himself was not justified before God after he was circumcised. Rather, it was before. Rather, it was before he received that. And that circumcision was a sign. It was specifically a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. so that He might be the Father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. Verse 12, And the Father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who follow, but also who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So Abraham is now the father of the Jewish nation, yes, as we know clearly from history, but now also the father, spiritually speaking, of those Gentile believers in the Gospel. And so we find that Jew and Gentile are brought together in unity. There is a unity in Christ amongst men. In in fact, my friends, I will say this, that in our day and age, we are surrounded by belief systems that divide men up unnecessarily. For example, in our public school system is the lie of evolution, the lie of an atheistic worldview propounded. And children are taught that there are certain races that have developed further. In fact, that's where the idea of, uh, for example, Hitler's racism against the Jews and even black people came from, was an evolutionary worldview. Whereas the Bible says there's no such thing as race. Race is heresy. God, the Scripture, we know from Scripture that God made all men from Adam and Eve. That we all descend from the same ancestors. Even the idea of race is a heresy. It's a lie. It's nowhere found in the Bible. In fact, it's contradicted that we are all related. We are all related because we all descend from Adam and Eve. And the early church was infected with this division amongst Jew and Gentiles. But the Gospel removes that in its entirety. In its entirety. 
I mentioned earlier that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And that is true. See, my friends, we must understand the character of God if we are to understand the gospel. If we are to understand salvation. See, my friends, we're not born with this inherent knowledge of God in its entirety. We, don't, we know that there is a God. We have a sense that there is a God. But His identity, His characteristics, His attributes must be brought to us in detail if we are to fully know Him as we ought to. We certainly know from looking around us in this created world that God is powerful, that God is wise, that God is constant because He sustains His creation over generations and generations. These are some of the attributes of God that we can see revealed in creation. But we need more knowledge of God than that. This knowledge that we have in creation is not enough, my friends. We need God and His grace to condescend, to reveal Himself to us. And He has done so through the Bible. Through the Bible. This is where God speaks to men, my friends. This is where God reveals Himself to man. It is not through visions, not through dreams, not through subjective experiences. Rather, it is through the objective written Word. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. It is profitable for us, my friends. And in Scripture we do find, as I quoted earlier, that God is a wrathful God. We know from the Old Testament book of Leviticus and even in the New Testament that the holiness of God is spoken of. The holiness of God. And to be holy means to be sacred, to be sanctified, to be set apart. We also know from throughout the Bible that God is gracious and compassionate. That He shows mercy upon His creation. That His mercies are over all His works. We know from 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. These things are true. But my friends, do not think that you can pick the attributes of God that make you comfortable and ignore the ones that make you uncomfortable. That you can, as many churchgoers do, think of God as a cosmic grandfather or a cosmic genie who bestows blessings on everyone and He's not angry. He does, he's not holy and He's not just. My friends, that's not the character of God. In fact, what do we find in Psalms? In Psalm 5. In Psalm chapter 5, verse 5, the psalmist writes, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Friends, we must deal with this God not a God of our own imaginations. Not a God who is even spoken of in the pulpits of many churches here. Rather, we must go to the Scriptures. We must seek out what the Scriptures say. It's not what I think. It's not what you think. It's what does the Bible say. There's an interesting passage in the book of Exodus where we see the attributes of God mentioned side by side together. By God Himself. It is God speaking on God. And God is specifically in this chapter speaking to Moses upon Mount Sinai. He says this in Exodus 34 verse 6. It says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And we all say, yes, that's true. Praise God. And then we read verse 7. The sentence is finished. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands. Who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet, He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. My friends, we see here that these attributes of God are lined up beside each other. God's grace, kindness, and mercy, but then His holiness, His justice, His holy wrath. 
Nahum chapter 1 says, jealous, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He, re he reserves wrath for His enemies. This is true, my friends. And this holiness of God, this, this separateness that God possesses, we see it in the giving of His holy law in the giving of His commandments, the Ten Commandments. If you've grown up in church, you're familiar with the Ten Commandments. But have you ever conceived of what were they for? What, what, are the, what are they there to do? A few things, actually, but one of them, one of the main things, is they are there to show us the character of God. How God is holy. What is God's standard? What does God see as right? And what does God see as wrong? We have to know this. We don't know this on our own. This needs to be shown to us. And so we find, as you probably will remember, that God says things like, you shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not murder. God says there also in Exodus 20 that you shall not commit idolatry. That is, you shall not worship any other God or make up a God in your own mind and who suits your own desires and your own lusts. And you may even call Him the God of the Bible. That's idolatry. Or for example, one of the Ten Commandments, God says you shall not make any graven images. You shouldn't worship images. And in churches like the Roman Catholic Church or Eastern Orthodox churches or even some Protestant churches. There are pictures of Jesus, pictures of the members of the Trinity everywhere. And that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. And so we see God's standard of morality. It's really high. It is a really high standard because God Himself is perfect. Perfect. In fact, there's a story in Mark 10 where uh, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus he says, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And you know what Jesus says back? He says, keep the commandments. And He lists some of the Ten Commandments. If we want to experience life, we have to keep the commandments that God gave. But here's the issue, my friends, and you know this yourselves. You know this inherently because of your conscience. Because your conscience tells you this that we cannot keep those commandments. This is where the issue lies. See, in the garden, before any, any evil thing had happened, man was there in the garden. Adam and Eve were there in the garden. The Garden of Eden. And the creation was perfect. However, God gave one restriction that they were not to eat of a certain tree in the garden. That they were forbidden to do so. And we know that the devil that Satan tempted the woman and the man and they fell. They broke God's law. They broke His command. And we know what happened from Romans 5 and from all of Scripture that all mankind and all creation was interrupted by this entrance of sin into the world and all things were corrupted. And now every single one of us are born as God-haters, as rebellious, as selfish, as prideful, as arrogant. That's why those of you who have children will know this. You don't have to teach your children to sin. You don't have to teach them to disobey. You have to teach them to obey. You have to teach them to behave. You have to teach them to be disciplined. That's because left to themselves, they'll destroy themselves by their own devices. And so we're all born into this state. We're all born in Adam, under Adam's headship, under, under Adam's federal headship. Born as God-haters and dead in sin and altogether ungodly. Paul highlights this in Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2 of that wonderful book. He says this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. 
Among them, we too, all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Many of you, my friends, I just described. And the hope of the gospel for sinners like yourselves and sinners like me, I'll say that I'm the chief of sinners, and I'm in greatest need of salvation. It is found in Christ, my friends. It is found in the work of God in the heart of man. Listen to what he says in verse 4. But God being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us who are in Christ Jesus. The only hope for sinful man is the work of God whereby He raises a dead sinner to spiritual life in His Son. And so the invitation is given by the Lord Jesus Himself in Matthew 11. Come to Me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Rest. But specifically highlighting those commands, God says you shall not lie. My friend, have you lied? God says you shall not steal. Have you stolen? These are simple things, but when you really think about it, they're impossible for us to keep. Impossible in our sinful state. You shall not commit idolatry. You ever worshipped anything or a false god or a god of your own making? That's idolatry. You ever served yourself rather than God? Then that's idolatry. Or as I mentioned earlier, pictures of the members of the Trinity, pictures of Christ. That's blasphemy. God is not represented by images on earth. In fact, in Exodus, when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, they made a golden calf and Aaron told the Israelites that that was God, that that's how God looked. And we know that God's anger burned against the Israelites because they thought that God could be represented by an image. Friends, if you have pictures of any members of the Trinity, burn them, throw them away. It's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. I could go on looking at these commands, my friends, but I think it's sufficient for us to see, to see the need that man has. Because of our sin before God, my friends, we deserve hell. We deserve to be cast into the lake of fire. We deserve to be put in that place which was originally made for Satan and his demons. It was not originally designed for man, but rather because of man's fall, he has, by his own choice, put himself there. Jesus spoke of the fate of the wicked in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. He said, These will go away into eternal punishment. The horrors of hell are great, my friends, but what is so bad about it is that it is eternal, that it never ends, just as heaven goes on and on forever, just as those in heaven experience perfect bliss in the presence of God for all eternity. So do those who reject the gospel. So do those who have transgressed the covenant of works, who have trampled underfoot God's laws. So do those who have done these things re receive that eternal punishment for their sin. And this is my burden, my friends. This is where my heart is broken for you, that if you continue on outside of Christ, this is where you will go. I wouldn't stand out here on a sidewalk on a cold day if I didn't care for your soul. If I didn't love you enough to say this, I wouldn't be out here. But I do, friends, and I want you to know. I want you to realize you, the state that you are in before God. The Scripture says it is good to fear God. We need to have a holy, a uh, perfect, a righteous fear of God. Because what what is prevalent in our day to treat God lightly? to almost joke of holy things. 
but rather we need to fear God. He is the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Jesus told His disciples, do not fear those who can destroy the body but cannot touch the soul. Rather, fear God who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. That's the word of Jesus. That's not me. If you conceive of Jesus as some feminized New Age speaker, then you probably have not read the Bible because Christ said very offensive things. He was gracious, very gracious, very loving, very merciful, but He was bold. He called, he called the, the Pharisees in His day, you brood of vipers. He called them sons of hell. He wanted to rebuke them. It wasn't that He hated them. He wanted to rebuke them. Show them the errors of their ways. My friends, I'd rather wound you with the truth. I'd rather shoot the error of truth into your heart rather than comfort you with lies. Comfort you with lies. Think about all those phony preachers on television. They have the nice suits. They have the, you know, the, the big jets. Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, Paula White, Beth Moore, all those liars. You know, they stand up there and they say what people want to hear. They say that what people want to hear. Friends, I have to say something you may not want to hear, but I care enough to say it. The one who loves you enough is the one who tells you the most truth. So listen, listen, friends, this is truth. But there is hope for sinners. There is hope for those who are deserving of hell. And it is in Christ. It is in Jesus Christ. It is in the atonement of Christ upon the cross. It is in the resurrection of Christ. It is in the ascension and the exaltation of Christ. It is in the constant intercession of Christ. As I said at the beginning, as, a, as the, the hymn writer said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. See, my friends, when the right time came, God in His mercy sent His Son into the world. Jesus came and He said in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to live obediently as we could not do to fulfill God's laws on behalf of His elect people. Out of love, out of mercy and grace. And then to speak of the peak of His humiliation. You and I are probably very familiar with this. That Jesus Christ laid down Himself willingly. As the Almighty God, He laid aside His privileges and was beat and was spat upon and made a public mockery and died upon the cross bearing the wrath of the Father against the sins of His people. Upon the cross, Christ being holy, harmless, and undefiled was clothed as it were in the filthy garments of the sin of His people. Jesus was credited with having committed the sin that I've committed and bore the wrath that is due unto me upon His own shoulders. Listen to how Isaiah 53 says this. Isaiah 53, verse 4, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. Verse 10, But Yahweh was pleased to crush Him. Upon that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. It was put away for the sins of His people. And three days later, we know that Christ was raised from the dead, that He was vindicated by the Father. That Christ is alive today and forevermore. And after that, He ascended into heaven. And we know from the book of Hebrews, it says three times in Hebrews, that He sat down at the right hand of God. Three times. First at the beginning of the book, one at the end, and one right in the middle. It's as if the author of Hebrews wants us to understand this, that Christ sat down. The work of redemption has been complete. Don't think that you can add something of your own making to the work of Christ. Don't think that you can add some sort of religious merit to the atonement of Christ. What an offense that is to the Son of God. Those who think that salvation is partially of Christ and partially of them don't know Christ. Friends, Jesus is jealous for all the glory. And He wants all of it. And so when He saves a man, He will do it all by Himself. All for Himself. 
And so the call of the Gospel, my friends, in light of what Jesus has done, is that you repent and believe it. Is that you repent and believe it. God calls all men everywhere to repent and to believe the Gospel. Now repentance simply means that we recognize our sin as what it is. That we recognize that we have transgressed God's law and that we cannot save ourselves from the plight that we deserve, from the, from the punishment that we deserve, from the plight that we are in, and that we endeavor to flee that sin and to turn from it. And faith is simply taking God at His Word. That's the essence of faith. That you believe the promises of God. And repentance and faith are not things that man can muster in himself. They are gifts granted by God. It's not the will of man, it is the will of God. We know from Romans 9.16, it is not of the one who wills or the one who runs, but on God who has mercy. And the promise is for those who will repent and believe that God will forgive them of their sin, past, present, and future, on account of the work of Christ, and that He will impute to their account the righteousness of Christ. That is what is meant when Paul says in Romans 4.3 that Abraham believed God and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. That's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus takes my sin and I receive His righteousness by grace. By grace. And this Gospel is not only for the lost, but for the believer. And so if you're a Christian, the Gospel is for you to dwell and to meditate upon daily, but then to go and make known to this lost and dying world. And I will say this very briefly. For those who have been saved, they now have new hearts and new desires, new affections. They no longer want to live the way that they used to live. They now, lo they now love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. They are born anew by the grace of God. So if you say that you're a Christian but you haven't been changed, it's because you never became a Christian. You may have taken upon yourself the name of a Christian. It's not that we are saved by our work. Rather, it is the work that evidences the fact that we've been saved. Actions speak louder than words, as the old phrase goes, and that is true, my friends. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus Himself said in Matthew 7, that there will be many on the day of judgment who will say to Him, Lord, Lord! And He will deny them entrance into His kingdom. Because though they claim to know Him, their lives were never changed. Their lives were never changed. So if you are in such a state, repent and believe. It is all by grace to the glory of God. That's the end of it. That is the chief end of man. The Baptist Catechism, question two, what is the, chi what is the chief end of man? Answer, the man, man's chief end is glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And that is certainly the end of this Gospel. The glory of God. And quite fitting that I'm preaching from Romans 4, because if we go over to Romans 11, Paul has already sufficiently discussed the issue of salvation, the sovereignty of God and salvation, many other things as well. He says this in verse 36 of Romans 11, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. How true that is. If you are lost, my friends, if you know that you are not a Christian, I exhort you to repent and to believe. If you say that you are, I encourage you to examine yourself, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to see whether you are in the faith. If you are a Christian, brethren, make this gospel known. We live in a lost and dying world. We live in those who are we live amongst those who are in the kingdom of darkness and need to be brought into God's marvelous light. So we've seen here in Romans 11, or excuse me, Romans chapter 4, in verses 9 through 12, that whether Jew or Gentile, the gospel is for all men. It's for those who believe it. And Abraham is an example of that, for he was saved before his own circumcision. We've seen that God is holy, and that we are separated from him because of our sin and deserving of hell.
But rich in mercy was He in sending His Son who died and rose again. And all who come to Him have forgiveness of sin and His imputed righteousness given to them by grace for His glory. So may Jesus Christ be glorified in all things forevermore. Amen and amen.